Hello, my friends. Today, we're going over days six through 10 of the Karen Reed trial. We're going to watch some body language, go over some of the key points the witnesses have testified to so far, and hopefully get some clarity to where we are and what is even happening in this trial. So let's get started. Let's go with this video here, which is a small compilation of some of the items that we have seen. Correct. But can I explain? Um, Mr. Lally will, I'm sure, let you explain. Um, at this point, I'm going to be asking the questions, if okay. you don't mind. Uh, is that an example of you using your position as a police officer to come to the aid of one of the members of the Albert family? Just the fish. Is there an objection? Yes, sir. Okay, the objection sustained. May we approach? The That's judge objecting for the But this was specific. We should have, and it wasn't objected to, right? Now so the judge's like, the defense doesn't get any break with me. A fight occurs, a complaint against you occurs, and then police reports are filed against the two people that, that are complaining against you. Is that the chronology? Yes. Is that right? I'm sorry, was there a question? The fire captain and his SUV, that's gone. Uh, I'm not sure. Who did you talk to at CPAC? Comment to his head area, correct? That's correct. And you said, quote, I'm not sure if he's been in a fight or whatever. Our medics don't believe he's going to make it. Correct. Um, Are you asking me where I work, where, or did I make a diagram? Whether that documented that. There's Karen's SUV and the evidence I the bag. I was, the shop. I was not in the police station for those two days. Let's look at the next step. Um, you recognize that? It appears to be solo cups with uh, substance inside. It appears to be solo cups. Oh, solo cups or the solo cups that you took? Wait, wait, wait. Didn't you guys get solo cups from the neighbors because you didn't have any evidence material and you didn't want to drive 30 minutes to go get any evidence supplies from the station? So you borrowed solo cups and you just grabbed the solo cups, scooped the snow, to get the blood and then just took the open solo cups with the blood and put it in these grocery bags from stop and shop. But you, now you're not sure. You're saying it appears to be solo cups, but I cannot be sure. Why? Back to station from the I mean, I couldn't say definitively, but it certainly looks like it. Uh, here's the this is one like Meadows Ave. I can't mask John O'Keefe's residence. This vehicle right here is um, Miss Reed's vehicle. I believe that vehicle there is uh, Mr. O'Keefe's vehicle. Michael Camerano, C. Okay, so before we get to the friends, let me just pause right here to make a observation. Okay, when we get to his friends, they're going to testify in the in this period of days. We're gonna see a different body language altogether from what we see with other witnesses, right? His friends, Mr. John O'Keefe's friends, are showing respect. Uh, they are showing that they are uncomfortable to be there. They are uncomfortable to be testifying about this horrible thing that has happened. They are showing normal nervousness, like they will not be sure about something or just uh, try to be straightforward as possible, but they are showing grief. They are showing sadness when they are speaking about their dear friend. Like you can see they don't want to be there but they're there and they show a whole different side. His wife, when she starts to testify, she'll say like, I don't remember who called who that morning. I know that I spoke to Carrie Roberts and she told me what was going on. So it's like regular memory gap that happens when you are in a traumatic situation, which is very different from what we're going to see with some of the McCabe's and some of the Albert's witnesses when they come up later and they just start being like, I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall. What do you mean? Is that a question? And they just start being so combative. So these witnesses show us a real emotional side and a respectful side of what we should be seeing from most of the witnesses in this trial, unless they were like just... Um, you know, the, 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 the scientific witnesses. But other than that, if you knew the victim and you, and you knew his story and you had a respect for him, you, I would expect to see some reverence and some grief, but here we go. These are John O'Keefe's friends. M E R A N. Catherine Camerano, C-A-M-E-R-A-N. I talked to Carrie Roberts in the morning. 
um, at some point. I don't know if I called her, she called me, um, and she said that I think that he was going to the hospital. And then I called my husband and told him that Kaylee was home alone and that he. While you were speaking to her, you have no, or you had no indication that she was slurring the words in any way, correct? I didn't think so, no. No. Uh, her eyes didn't appear to be bloodshot and glassy, correct? Correct. She wasn't swaying or stumbling in any way, correct? Correct. Uh, she didn't appear to be confused in her thinking or her speech. She did not. How many tables, what kind of tables that you observed? How many chairs were typically being around the lookout? Is there, um, in addition to being a bar, is it also sort of a restaurant? Mm -hmm. is there in the kitchen, <laughs> there is typically two cooks. Do you recall the name of the band or what kind of music? High tops and the low tops, uh, starting with the low tops. About how many chairs were typically being around the lookout? So sort of a restaurant, you serve food. Mm -hmm. and, is there, and is there sort of a, uh, how is that staffed as far as kitchen staff? Uh, and maybe pretty well understood, but just as far as your duties and sort of responsibilities as a bartender, what, what is the addition? Um, I serve drinks. Things of that nature as well. She serves drinks, she's a bartender, and amazingly enough, the Commonwealth prosecutor who is actually asking these questions right now, they're charging the defendant with a DUI. Did they ask this bartender how many drinks did Carrie Reed have? Were they alcoholic? Was she intoxicated by the time she left? None of it. But we do know how many cooks were in the kitchen. We know there is a band and almost found out what kind of music they play. We know they have tables that are high top, they have low tops. We know they buy their glasses at Home Depot. What else do we know? We know they have chairs. We know that a bartender serves drinks. We know that a bar also serves food. And those are the questions that the questions that Mr. Lolly decides should be asked to this witness. Yes. Now, when it comes to um, the glass uh, that's the waterfall hat, um, where does the that glass. Where, where does that come from? Like, where do we buy it? Is that what you're asking? Uh, typically, Restaurant Depot. And is there like a certain oh, type of uh, well, time with Mr. O'Keefe? Yes. Yeah. Anybody else in the, in the force? Okay. And here are the Greeks, not to be confused with the Asians. And that's not me, okay? I'm not the one calling anybody any of that uh, by their nationality. But a lot of people that came, that were together that night after they were being asked, you know, who was there? They would say, oh, there was like a Greek couple and they wouldn't remember their names. And these two, the couple, the Greek couple, they're so amazing. They're so beautiful. And we're going to see why we like them so much. And then the Asians reference was uh, another witness saying, oh, we have uh, neighbors. They're the Asians. We don't know their names. So that's why I'm making this joke. So let's see why we like them so much. Yes, other uh, than my wife, I mean, for some. <laughs> the catch. You're going to for that later. Fair enough. I get voting um, points for that, right? I almost started changing on my clothes and I said I wasn't going to go. Eventually, did you decide to go? My kids told me to go. They did. They actually um, they said to me, you never go out, you don't do anything. Dad's by himself, you should go. And just keep him company while you go. Um, how much he sacrifices, how um, he's like unconditionally puts all his time and effort into the kids, how she admired him for that. Um, and how she uh, also wished that some of the family members would step up and help out a little bit more. Now, as far as um, obviously you're at a bar and people are drinking, um, did you, what if anything, did you observe Mr. O'Keefe be drinking that night? I believe he was drinking beer. And as far as Ms. Reed was concerned, what if anything, did you observe her to be drinking that night? She was drinking something out of a clear glass, perhaps. Uh, so a clear glass with a clear liquid in it? Correct. See, so they talked. It seemed like they were like quite lovey dovey at that point. And then Quite lovey-dovey. Now, before we get into days 6 through 10, we're going to do a very, very quick recap of what happened between days 1 through 5 and who said what real quick. So, starting right here on day 1, the first witnesses in on this trial were John O'Keefe's uh, brother, Paul O'Keefe, his wife, Erin O'Keefe, and then we'll start with the police. But before we do that, the main things from the brother uh, when he testified was that he did see the couple fight in 2021 and also that Karen spoiled the kids. Same thing we are going to hear from his friend later. Now, Erin, she's going to testify that her and Karen were friends. And the thing that did not, did not go well for Karen on this testimony, in my opinion, is that she said Karen told her, 
I'll never see you guys again the day that Mr. Keith died. So that was a little weird because, you know, if you are friends with someone and you're part of the family per se uh, and something awful happens, what is the natural thing that you would expect? Like either Aaron saying, are you okay? Or Karen saying, are you guys okay? I'll be here for you. How are we going to make arrangements? We can get through this together. Uh, what are we going to do? Like we're a team, right? And the fact that Karen was like, got, she went to their house, just got her stuff and left and said, I'll never see you guys again is very strange in my opinion. So I don't know what that's all about. We'll see if more will be reviewed in that subject. Then they move on to the officers. We got Steven Seraph, the officer that said, Karen Reed said, this is my fault. But the only thing that is weird about that is that this officer has never testified to that in the grand jury in any of his reports. There is nothing saying that there. So he's saying he got to a crime scene. There is a hysterical lady screaming, this is my fault. And he didn't arrest her. He didn't question her. And he didn't even note that in his report. Now, when he gets to the trial in 2024, that's when he decides to mention that. So it's very suspicious that he says that, but it is his phrase. This is my fault is in his testimony. Now we have Stephen Mullaney, another officer. He says he did not see any broken plastic at the scene. And that is important to remember because one of the items in the prosecution opening statements is the fact that they found broken taillights or broken plastic consistent with taillights at the crime scene. This is the first responder saying, I'm one of the first ones at the scene and I did not see any broken taillights. Then we hear from Timothy Nuttall, Nuttall, I'm definitely not gonna be able to pronounce that correctly. And he says he heard Karen Reed say, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him three times. And that is a thing because a lot of people are gonna say, she said it three times. And Jennifer McCabe, when she testifies, OMG, it's like a record playing. She, she does like a performance. She looks at the jury, she looks at the judge, and she looks at everybody else. She says, I heard Karen Reed say, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Anyways, that's for another, another video. Then we have this Mr. Firefighter, paramedic, Anthony Flamati. He says he also heard her saying, I hit him, I hit him. Oh my God, I hit him. Then we, oh, and also uh, in blue here, it's not in his report either. So these are all people that were at the scene and it wasn't in his report. Then we moved to another firefighter, Matthew Kelly. And all he says he heard Karen say, say was, is he alive? Then we have Francis Walsh also says he heard Karen say, is he alive? So these last two did not say they heard anything. But from all these people, we have three people saying they heard Karen confess some type of I hit him or oh my God, I hit him or this is my fault statement. So far, we have three people testifying to that. Okay, then we move on to the uh, firefighter paramedic Katie McCollin, I hit him, I hit him. She definitely said she heard that. Then what has become, you know, glaring about her is that the defense asked, do you know whose house that was? Do you know Caitlin Albert? She says, ah, Caitlin Albert, no, but I went to high school with somebody named Caitlin. And that is so weird because even this guy is like, really, really, really? The paramedic is like, really, Katie? because we do have pictures of Katie with Caitlin Albert and it becomes a whole thing. We move on to Gregory Woodbury, who's a paramedic, and he says all he heard Karen Reed say, say was, is he dead, is he dead? Then we have Daniel Whitley, another paramedic, and he's the one that comes to the scene to bring Karen Reed to the hospital for the section 12. Uh, and they also introduced the fact that Karen was diagnosed with MS. Then we have Jason Becker. 
He says she was distraught and had blood on her face. So far, we have four people who have testified. Karen Reed has done some type of confession. We have Stephen Seraf. We have Anthony Flamati. Flamati. We have Timothy. I'm just gonna leave it there. Leave it at Timothy today. And then we're gonna have Katie. So four people so far on the first five days are going to say here in this trial that Karen Reed has confessed somehow. I hit him. It's my fault. But they did not have it in their reports. None of them had it in their reports initially since 2022. I don't know. Then we come to oh, one of my favorites, uh, Paul, Lieutenant Paul Gallagher. Okay. <sighs> He used the neighbor's solo cups. He went to the neighbors to get solo cups to get the evidence. And they could have driven about 30 minutes to the station to get supplies for the evidence collection. They also used a leaf blower to clear the snow. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? They found blood stains at the scene and drinking glass. So I don't see anything about taillights here from these guys. Some of the things that he said that were really glaring to me was when Alan Jackson asked him, did you search the house for any evidence? He said, of course not. Did you ask them for consent? He says, absolutely not. Why not? I'm familiar with probable cause. So he arrives at the scene, right? There is blood. There's a body. There's a house. It's. I mean, imagine that you have a body in your lawn. Then the police gets there and they're not going to knock on your door and ask you any questions. They're just going to take the body to the hospital and move on and just start processing the lawn. No, they're going to knock on your door. Can we come in, please? Uh, they're going to ask you to come in or we need to ask you a couple of questions. You're probably going to be startled and like, sure, come on in. You're not going to be like, you have a warrant or something. You've got a warrant to come in. So then, they're gonna and no finding a dead body on somebody's lawn is not probable cause, which I heard from some of the YouTuber attorneys, which is very odd, right? I would think the a dead body is definitely probable cause, but he could have asked, Can we can we talk to you guys? And then looked into the house to see if there's any signs of struggles, any pieces of evidence, any broken bottles, anything that may give them a clue. To what happened to Mr. John O'Keefe. But they don't ask, and he is, in my opinion, arrogant when he is answering these questions because he's like, of course not. What does that mean? Why? And the defense attorney asks him why, because he's a he's a member of the Kanta police as well, because his family is connected to the Kanta police. And then he says no. So why didn't you ask for a warrant? If that's your thing, you want to have a warrant, why didn't you ask for one? Oh, because I know what probable cause is. I'm familiar with probable cause. So you are the judge, right? Because usually you have to go to a judge to request a warrant. But this guy decided all by himself that he's familiar with probable cause and there would be no warrant. So here's the solo cups, the blood, the stop and shop bag. And here's the police car carrying all the solo cups because from now on, they believe that that's fine. They think that's okay. Then we're going to move on to Sean Good, Canton Police Department, also used the solo cups, used the leaf blower, and found the blood stains and drinking glass. Now we're going to pick up, I believe, on day six with Sean Good. So, here is the six through ten. Believe that that photo is from the same date that you are writing the report, correct? Objection. Sustained. Do you think it's misleading to include a photo on the face sheet of the report when the report is dated January 29th, 2022, and the photo is not from that day, it's from sometime later? Objection. Sustained. <laughs> is there anything on what is now marked? Exhibit 44 on that face sheet that indicates the date and time that that 
photo on Exhibit 44 was taken? No. Is there anything on Exhibit 44, that face sheet of your report, that indicates that it applies to some supplemental report that was later filed? No. Any other more? Yes. Nothing further, thank you. All right, please take the exhibit down. So here is what the defense attorney is questioning Sergeant Good about at this point. Sergeant Good had a police report dated on January 29, 2022. The first one on top. And if you look at the green arrows after, you know, one of the green arrows, the date, the second is the exhibit 43. The third little green arrow is a little picture. That picture does not show any taillights found. Somebody, maybe a ghost, switched the picture, but it maintained the report date, everything, saying this is the report that was uh, done at the scene. And now they attached a picture with taillights being found. And this is important because, again, the prosecution is saying, we found plastic that is consistent with taillight at the crime scene. To link that to the defendant, right? That she hit her, uh, Mr. John O'Keefe at the scene and left some pieces of her car, her SUV taillight there. Now, a lot of the first responders that were just, that were there first, they said, we didn't find anything. And the picture that Mr. Sergeant Good had said, we didn't find anything. So how come somebody, he doesn't know who, he doesn't know how, took a picture with taillights and then put it in the first report? And he says, well, sometimes, you know, people do it as a supplement uh, from this, somebody from the station, and then it's not my responsibility. But you don't know who, like, you don't know who could have taken your report and just switch the picture, not adding as a supplement, but just switched it. So the first uh, on top here, the first figure is the original police report. And then this figure on the bottom is the second police report or the same one with the picture changed. So it's just interesting to see uh, the fact that he answers also, I never saw a piece of taillight on January 29th at the crime scene. Someone added a taillight photo. I don't know who. So let's take a look at how his body actually uh, reacts to this interaction from the defense. He's going to get, uh, let me just watch this with you guys a little bit slower. Include a photo on the face sheet of the report when the report is dated January 29, 2022. And the photo is not from that day, it's from some time later. Objection. Sustained. <clears throat> Blinking. Is there anything on what is now marked? Looking at somebody, 44, biting his lips. On that face sheet that indicates the date and time that that photo on exhibit 44 was taken. Has an itchy note. I may have a moment. Drinking yes. water. Nothing further, thank you. All right, please take the exhibit down. Again. I may have a moment. Yes. Nothing further, thank you. All right. So Yannetti confronts him saying, this is a little bit misleading because you're not saying it's a supplemental report. So then his body just reacts, you know, with the normal nose touching, drinking water, biting lips, excessive blinking, which are all uh, in a cluster, like mixed together, just signs of anxiety because he's, he's being questioned about something that he didn't do it perfectly. So he's anxious and nose touching could be a subconscious attempt to relieve anxiety associated with dishonesty. 
So we don't know what the intention from, from this witness is. We don't know what actually happened. We don't know if he's telling the truth or not. All we can do is observe how his body reacts as he's answering. Now we're gonna know a lot more about nose touching from our next witness, Mr. Michael. Uh, with regard to the CPAC while you were on scene that morning. I got a return call from Trooper Michael Proctor. And uh, from your conversation with Trooper Proctor, uh, what was your understanding as, as far as their response uh, to the scene at that time? So at that point in time, Trooper Proc Proctor informed me that they would not be responding. A return call from Trooper Michael Proctor. And uh, from your conversation with Trooper Proctor, uh, what was your understanding as as far as their response uh, to the scene at that time? So at that point in time, Trooper Park Proctor informed me that they would not be responding. So as Sergeant Link responds about Michael Proctor here, he has a little itchy nose or touched the nose, which I'm going to read this reference. I'm not saying it is what he is doing here, but overall touching the nose or nose scratching can be a subconscious attempt to relieve anxiety associated with dishonesty. Nose scratching or rubbing the nose is a behavior that may be observed in individuals who are deceptive. Nose scratching may suggest potential deception but relying solely on this cue is far from foolproof. And of course, right, of course, nothing is 100% and body language is a, a fluid thing. We have to observe the person as a whole. Every person is individually unique. And maybe some of the things I do with my body language don't mean the same thing as another person. So we look at the baseline. The baseline is how does a person react normally? What are their reactions? How is their face? What are things that they usually do when talking normally about something that is not stressful? Or we also have to look at clusters. Clusters is a combination of things in body language. For example, here with Michael Link, he has what kind of clusters? His forehead is frowned. He's raising his eyebrows. His lips are pursed right after he says that Michael Proctor is not going to be responding. And this is be, uh, when he says the name Trooper Proctor, he itches his nose. So let's say, for example, if we are trying to interpret this, that when he touches his nose is a sign of relieving anxiety, right? Uh, let's say he is doing the eyebrow raise with the forehead frown, which could be uh, in this situation sign of disapproval because the eyebrows raised could be surprise, fear, disbelief, uh, could be flirting. So none of that actually uh, applies here. But because he also has the lips pursed, that is a sign of disapproval. So combined with the forehead and the eyebrows raised, maybe his face is saying, well, Michael Proctor said he wouldn't be showing up to process the scene. And he didn't like that. He disapproved because look at what happened afterwards, right? They ended up having to use the solo cups and the leaf blower. And everybody is like, really? That's what you guys did for the investigation? No, I had met them. I had met Brian. I didn't know him other than just being Chris's older brother when we were younger kids. Certainly with regard to Chris, you would consider him a close friend. And again, I had met them. I had met Brian. I didn't know him other than just being Chris's older brother when we were younger kids. And my nose. With regard to Chris, itch, 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 itch. Me? Friends with Chris? Consider who a close friend. Chris. Yes. First names only because they're all... Sure. Sure. 
uh, uh, Chris and I were pretty good friends uh, when uh, we were younger, yes. Okay. So again, Michael Inc. is touching his nose at the end of the phrase, I just knew Brian Albert was Chris's older brother. So is that true? Is he being deceptive here? Touching the nose? Anxiety associated with dishonesty? I don't know. But here we got a couple of interesting things. We got Chris Albert. This is an actual picture of him when he was running for something. Uh, and it says, vote Chris Albert. So I had to add some boxing gloves. We fight together and a pizza and also the guy from the get off my lawn guy because Chris Albert is going to, you know, be questioned about that because that was uh, Mr. Nevercracker or something is the nickname that Chris Albert ends up giving to Mr. John O'Keefe. So in all good fun, right? In all good fun, uh, we have these pictures here. But yes, definitely Michael Link touched his nose when he said the name Proctor. He touched his nose when he said, I just knew Brian was Chris's older brother. Is he trying to distance himself from Brian because that is the person who owns the property where the body was found? Or is that true? I, I don't know him at all. Like I just knew kind of sort of that he was Chris's brother. And are you friends with Chris? Um, um, we were friends when we were young. So why is it that there is going to be conversation about you getting involved in a fight to protect Chris after being at a bar and like drinking and then activating your police badge to defend Chris? You guys are like friends in when you were in preschool, right? When you were younger. So why? Anyways, now they're going to introduce a video of the officer Michael Link arriving at the scene. And then we're going to watch his reaction to the questions that the attorney is going to. Does it appear at this point, if you can see, does it appear that you've ended that call or at least your hands are down by your side? I can't tell. Okay. Um, you would agree with me. That's all I can for that. You would agree with me that that was, a, a, without counting the seconds, that was about a five-minute phone call or maybe a little better than five minutes? I wasn't watching, to be honest. Do you have any idea who you were talking to now that you've seen that? I could make an educated guess, but I don't know for sure. Um, you did notice that several minutes after Jen McCabe went in the house, and while you were on that phone call, the lights finally came on at 34 Fairview, correct? Correct. At the point the lights came... Wait. So this is uh, him being asked about Jen McCabe. Come on... The ladder truck had already gone, left from the scene, correct? The I fire believe. Engine. I believe so. The firefighters are all gone. Going to be pulling his ear with the raised eyebrows and the forehead frown. Yes. The ambulance has already left. Go back to normal speed. Mr. O'Keefe. Yes. The paramedics are gone, the EMTs. Yes. Fire captain in his SUV, that's gone. Is that a Is that question? Right? I, I'm sorry, was there a question? Yes. The fire captain in his Is SUV. Is that that's gone? gone. Uh, question mark? I'm question not mark? sure. In other words, all the fire and EMTs. Have I don't see them on camera. Doesn't appear that any fire or EMTs are still on scene, correct? Doesn't appear so. Um, Carrie Roberts is gone. Yes. Karen Reed is gone. Yes. So when the only parties left at the scene are members of the Albert. I'm going to make it in slow motion again, because after he's asked about Jim McCabe, he's going to be grabbing his nose this time. So the ear, the nose. Family. Jim McCabe. And, and the nose. Kent Police Department representatives. That's when the lights. Looks down. Inside 34 Fairview finally came on. Okay. Oh, okay. 
So he's like, okay, if that's what you say, I don't want to answer any of these questions. Get me out of here. I got stuff to do and I need to buy some solo cups. Just, just the evasiveness, the lack of accountability, the lack of remorse, you know, for saying, you know what? Yeah, that was messed up. I, I, we weren't aware it was going to be considered a crime scene. Everybody was stressed out, so we did let Jen McCabe go into the house or something. But the whole, all right, whatever, whatever you say, you know, is just off-putting. But anyways, let's go back to this body language thing we do sometimes. We have a pursed lip, right, completely closed. We have him being like looking to the side, kind of like a contempt we have him pulling his ear. He's also going to pull his nose. So let's see what we have about earlobe pulling. Earlobe pulling or massaging the ear indicates the signals that they are under stress. So yes, he's under stress because he's been questioned about his performance work-wise. People often pull their ears because it helps them relax. Sudden, noticeable flushing of the ear, like different parts of the body, suggests fear or anxiety. Now, we do have to remember to look at the clusters, look at the combination of micro expressions, expressions on the face or the body. So in this case, he's pulling the ear and he also has the forehead frown. So pulling the earlobe is uh, also considered a way to block the information from coming in. It's kind of like you're bothered by what you're hearing and you just want to block it. But if the forehead is wrinkled, or the eyebrows furrowed, which in this case they are, then you can assume this gesture to be a negative one. He talks about the, when he says, I'm sorry, was that a question? He closes his lips, which is a classic sign of anger, including when the anger is suppressed. Uh, also, when he says, Hold on, let me read this here. Let me take myself off of it. In the past, he was involved in a fight helping Chris Albert. Okay, this is what I want to say, just like as a summary of why he's so anxious. Michael Link doesn't like to be in this position because he was involved in a fight, right? Let me read this for you guys. Uh, no one was arrested the night of the fight. So Chris Albert asked him to help him. He activated his police badge. No one was arrested. Then a day later, one of the men that was involved in the fight went to Kenton police to fire a complaint against Michael Lake. Then after that, the Kenton police filed charges against the guy. So it's very, very strange, right? Because he tries to help Chris Albert. Then he's like drinking in, and then he goes to his car after drinking at a bar, not 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 on duty at all, right? He goes to the car. Then Chris Albert comes, says, "Hey, these guys don't want to fight me. They want to fight me." Then he says, "Well, let's not fight. You know, everybody goes home." But somehow a fight ensued. Then nobody was arrested. It was like a buddy buddy thing, right? But Michael Link did say, "I'm an officer. Here's my badge, Captain Save a Ho." Now. After that, everybody goes home. The next day, the people that were in the fire were like, let's file a complaint about this guy because he's like using his police badge, you know, and then he punched me in the face. Then Michael Lang decides to file a complaint only after they filed a complaint or file charges only after they file a complaint. Must be nice, right? Must be nice to just be like selective on how we apply the law. I mean, most people love superheroes, but I don't know if this is the superhero that we have in mind. Somebody who just activates his police badge whenever is convenient for him. But anyways, let's move on. So now we're going to go over the part where he's being asked about, didn't you say the victim looked like he was in a fight? And we're going to see how his body reacts here. Could have been a multitude of things. But what was going through your mind at that point was it could have been a fight or whatever. 
because he had trauma to his head. Those were your words. <coughs> Those were my words, yes. Okay. So you didn't think it was like some old man who died of old age? Right? Based on his age, no, I wouldn't have suspected that. Just a no would have sufficed. Or something. Again, it could have been a multitude of things to cause those injuries. So at that point in time, we had no idea what we were what we were looking at. But you were aware that it had something to do with a violent incident. He had trauma to his face. And he's unconscious, correct? Yes, you know. Sustained. Did you believe that there were any indicators that Mr. O'Keefe had been involved in some sort of a physical altercation? Possibly. Okay. And that's because you used the phrase, he had trauma to his face and head, right? That's what I had been told, yes. So based on what you had been told, you knew that there was a person laying out uh, unconscious just outside a residence that may have been involved in a physical altercation. That's fair. It's a possibility, yes. Again, there were a multitude of things that were going through my head as possibilities. But that's one of the, the premier possibilities, right? I wouldn't say it's premier. It was one of the possibilities. And it's logical to believe that if a fight had occurred, very well may have started inside the residence 30 feet away. Excuse me. Objection, Your Sister Rack. Did you believe? Why is that sustained, that though? Possible, like, we want to know. A violent confrontation was possible in your mind that it could have started inside the house. Objection. Sustained. Yes. Stop sustaining everything, Judge. Seriously, we want to know. Wouldn't it be... A normal assumption after finding your body at somebody's lawn to question the people in the house to whether there was a fight or whatever. I mean, I guess so, but not not for this judge, not for this judge. So we're going to go with, is this the one that we want to see? Let me see. Let me see. No, this is, I'm sorry. There was a question. This is the next slide we're going to go over. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. So he says, I don't know if I, if he had been on a fight or whatever, he touches his, no, uh, I'm sorry, his eye. It's kind of like a blocking and it's amazing how they do it, you know, um, subconsciously, organically. But it's almost like he did a perfect picture for us, right? Because he's like, this is what an eye touch would be. And then we take a picture. So a brief touch of the eyes during a conversation may give you a clue to a person's negative perception of what is being discussed. So that's a clue. Do you think he's having a negative perception? Yes. Yes, I do. And blocking behaviors, right? Anytime you're blocking your lips, your eyes, blocking may manifest in the form of closing the eyes, rubbing the eyes, or placing the hands in front of the face. And a lot of the resources that I use are from the book by Joe Navarro called What Everybody is Saying. Joe Navarro, famous FBI interrogator, very famous for his body language books. Uh, so some of the definitions that I get are from that book. And if you're interested, go check it out. You can buy it on Amazon or any other library. It's very interesting. Let's go over in slow motion. Space and he's unconscious, correct? Yeah, <laughs> Looks at the side. The forehead is frowned. There's a little thing with his lips right now. Kind of like very quick. What fighters do when they're gonna? Did you believe that there were any somebody, indicators like, like that? Kind of an anger Mr. thing. Mr. O'Keefe had been involved in some sort of a physical altercation. Possibly. Okay, and that's because you used the phrase "in trauma to his face and head." That's a person. Right? That's approval. what I had been told. Yes. So. Based on what you it's had first been again, told, touches the eye you as knew a blocking that there was mechanism. A person laying out uh, unconscious just now a outside person who's going to readjust his posture. May have been kinda like this is serious. This is serious. Let me stop being evasive, sarcastic, you know, saying all things were possible, possibly. I have no idea if it was in a fight or whatever. When he's readjusting his posture is right when the defense attorney is saying, you knew there was a person there, right? Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about a real person, somebody who was highly admired, honored, respected. So then the you can see Michael Link like get back into his seat and be like, okay, 
this is a serious thing. I should be showing a little bit more respect. And that's what we're going to talk about today for body language was pretty much Michael Lank and Sergeant Good on these uh, days. But what else happened between days six and 10? We had uh, this one, Lieutenant Charles Ray. He was witness 16. He took a car equipped with a dash cam to the O'Keefe's house just a few hours after Mr. O'Keefe was found unresponsive in the snow. And his video camera, when he gets to the O'Keefe's house, shows the SUV parked nearby with missing pieces of taillight. Now, something I remember the defense attorney claiming in their opening statement is that there will be a ring camera video showing the taillight was already broken beforehand or something. So we haven't seen that being introduced yet. And of course, we have our friend, prosecutor Lolly, asking what, if anything, and I might have to just watch the whole trial again just to do a compilation of the what, if anything, sort of, if anything, or if anyone. But I'm not sure if I can handle listening to Lolly for all that time. So after the what, if anything, and after the Charles Ray, because that's pretty much his uh, direct examination always. We go to day seven. Day seven, we have his friends. We're going to have... Camarano, Mr. Michael Camarano with his wife, Catherine Camarano. Pretty much Michael comes in, says that John was celebrating, that they received the acceptance letter for his niece. He confirms that the couple would argue sometimes because Karen would spoil the kids. And that's what we saw in the first video that I played today. His wife comes in, Catherine Camarano, called her husband to go check on the kids when she got the call in the morning. We have Kurt Roberts uh, saying pretty much, I mean, I don't even know what was pertinent that Kurt testified to. I wrote here, he was drinking a Bud Light because I listened to his testimony again. I was like, okay, yeah, they, they were at the bar. Nothing eventful happened. They were, not, you know, nobody observed anybody fighting. We, what, do you, what if anything, why, if anything, are you bringing these witnesses into court? Mr. Lolly, why, if any, if any reason ever. So then we have Rebecca Trayers, who is a bartender, very lovely girl. Uh, you know, you can see she's nervous, but she's trying her best to, to get through the questions that Lolly is asking her. Uh, she testified, you know, like we saw in the first clip that I played, if you haven't seen it, go back to the beginning, the very beginning. Lolly asks the, the bartender, uh, what kind of tables they have, how many cooks are in the kitchen, what kind of glasses do they have, where do they buy their glasses, what kind of uh, music the band plays. But he does not ask the bartender how many alcoholic drinks did you serve the defendant and was she intoxicated? Because she's here for a DUI charge, right? So, right. I don't, I don't understand. Maybe somebody else can explain it to me. But we did not see um, we did not see that question. Then we have the Greeks, the Greeks, our favorite couple, the Colokithians. Colokithians. We got Nicholas, and he says, um, when Jackson asks, you didn't ask, you didn't see any body language between the two of them meaning Karen and John, that would suggest an argument. He says, no, in fact, I noticed the opposite. They were affectionate toward each other, lo loving toward each other to the point that my wife was like, why aren't you not like that with me? <laughs> and his wife is absolutely lovely as well. Both very lovely couples. You know, when she talks about my husband, those are the faces that I capture her doing, like my husband. It just a very lovely couple. Uh, when his wife, Karina Kolokitas, um, took the stand, she said that, and we saw that we saw that clip on the clip that I that I did in the beginning. 
when she was talking about Karen saying how much she admired John, that he devoted so much of his time to the kids and everything else. So we end with them here and talking about the lovey dovey body language that Karen and John were displaying. So nobody saw any fights. Nobody saw any arguments the night off. A lot can happen though, but we're going to stop here. And I know that we have more people from day six to 10, but I am working on something very exciting for all of you. It's called the Alberts. The Alberts is going to get a video of their own. This is the next video. It's part two of this video and it's coming soon. I'll probably publish by tomorrow. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm so grateful for all the comments, all the support. It really means the world to me that this content is actually uh, being well received. And like I said, I'm just starting to make this type of com content. So if you could please subscribe to my channel, make a comment, share, like it really helps out the algorithm to recommend the video to more people and i appreciate and i'm so happy that you guys are here see you next time with the alberts have a great day